Welsh tourist in New York asks the taxi driver if he's heard of Wales. And the cabbie says, Do you mean the fish or them singing schmicks? Our reputation as a land of song has reached overseas. And I'm one of them singing schmucks. Five days a week, I lecture at the University of Glamorgan. It's my work, and I enjoy it. Two nights a week, I sing second tenor in one of Wales' best-known choirs, the Penderis in the Ronda. I enjoy that even more. That's a distinctive sound, isn't it? Robust, fervent, warm, and uniquely Welsh. Like thousands of Welsh people, I enjoy singing. Not by myself. Ask me to sing solo, and I'll empty your room in five seconds flat. It's singing with other people in harmony that does it for me. It's one of the things that defines me as a Welshman. It's our birthright. So what am I doing here among the dead in Aberdeer Cemetery? I deal in the dead. I'm a historian. And I want to know how we became a country of singers, the land of song. And I think the story starts right here. The man responsible for earning for Wales its title, the land of song, was Griffith Rhys Jones. One of those people so renowned that he was known by just one name, Caradog. This is the grave of Caradog. He liked the violin, but it wasn't this that made him nationally famous. It was this. He was a big man with a baton and a big ambition and a big statue in honour in Aberdeer town centre. There are statues all over Wales to generals, politicians, local worthies, even sportsmen. Why not? But there's only one to a conductor and it's here. And he didn't conduct trams or buses. Look at his baton. He conducted choirs. 130 years ago, Caradog took a huge choir of 400 voices to London to compete and win two years running. Its nucleus came from Aberdeer, but there were contingents from all over industrial South Wales. And their success is what earned Wales a reputation of being the land of song. This choir was called the South Wales Choral Union, and the first group to represent Wales before there was a Welsh rugby team or football team, let alone Welsh assembly. It's actually quite appropriate to be standing here in front of the Black Lion because he was born in a public house just up the valley in Cullen. He rose from being a blacksmith to become a landlord and hotelier. And by the time of his death in 1897, he was the wealthy director of various breweries. In his day, Welsh society knocked back religion and music and sport in large drafts. The Welsh had sung before the coming of industry, but their congregations were rural and scattered. Now they migrated in droves to the ironworks and coal mines of South Wales, sucked into the great vacuum cleaner which the industrial valleys of Glamorgan and Kent were rapidly becoming. And they brought with them their language, their hymns, and their popular culture of songs and ballads, as fiddlers, harpists and entertainers enlivened many a Noson on Lawen and happy hour in the tavern. The comfort these brought helped these new communities through the transition to a new and unfamiliar environment. And it was no soft landing. In the 1800s, the coal mine townships of the heads of the valleys from Blynav to Hedman were rough, tough frontier settlements. Parts of Merthyr, like Jackson's Bridge in China, were notorious dens of crime and vice. Pubs like this throbbed 
day and night to the sound of tipsy step dancers, balladeers, and frantic fillers. It was poems and pints, all right. And fights, big time. Drink was a curse, as well as a consolation in places like Boris, where there were over 200 beer houses in mid-century, or Blackwood, where there was a drinking house for every five of the population. Industrialists like the guests and the crochets wanted a sober workforce and wasn't constantly hammered. They were glad to see the emergence of the temperance movement, which recruited thousands to the course with its processions, banners and singing. Choirs and began competing against each other. But where could they go? The pubs wouldn't do. In any case, they didn't have room for large numbers of singers. The only alternative was the chapel, and soon there was no shortage of them. Throughout the 19th century, chapels were opening in Wales at the rate of one a week. Here in Aberdeer, 50 went up in the middle years of the century. And it was here too that the first singing festival, the Gaman Vagani, was held in 1859. Lusty congregational singing helped people forget their drab environment. Soon there were temperance choirs, chapel choirs, works choirs, town choirs. But what do they sing apart from hymns? They can't sing popular ditties and ballads in chapels. What they did sing were oratorio choruses and specially composed anthems now available in cheap, handy, pocket-sized editions in this new tonic solfa musical notation. The solfa basically converted crotchets and quavers into syllables. Do, re, mi, fa, so. This made it easier to read a piece of music and sing in any key. Overnight, the Welsh became literate in a new language. choruses of uh, oratorios such as Mendelssohn's Elijah and uh, Handel's Samson and Judas Maccabeus appealed to, uh, to the Welsh temperament. After all, we've got to realise that Wales was a deeply religious country at this time and uh, they were very familiar, the people were familiar with, uh, with scriptural rep uh, references and Old Testament uh, dramatisations. composers then who followed this style of composition? Well indeed of course and uh, of, of Welsh composers I think one of the most important uh, and in, indeed one of the most popular was John Ambrose Lloyd and his anthem Tyrannasso the Liar which was described by Joseph Parry famously as the Hallelujah Chorus of the Welsh that was one of the most popular one of the top ten if you like in the charts. Anthems like that made them frequent test pieces and it was the kind of music, robust and dramatic himself, that Caradog thrived on. So when it was announced that a massive national music meeting was going to be held in the Crystal Palace in London in 1872, there was immense and immediate interest shown in that project in Wales. Several leading musicians met in Aberdeen and decided to raise a large choir composed of contingents from the leading choral centres of South Wales. The test pieces were Bud and Thunder Chorus of Light. They had the vocal resources to do them justice, and they had a man to lead them, Caradog. Preparing for it must have been a logistical nightmare, and throughout 1872, selected contingents practised under their local conductors, but eventually assembled in Aberdeer. And they came from all over South Wales, from Bryn Mawr and Blaenavon and Ebu Vale, from Tredegar and Rumney, from Merthyr and Dowlais and Aberdeer, over to Swansea and Llanelli in the west, places where the heart of industrial Wales was beating like a steam hammer. Now a mighty choral phalanx of 450, they were ready for the assault on London, and Londoners had never heard anything like it. One of the test pieces was called Round About the Starry Throne by Handel.
When Carruthers Choir made their first entry, the stupendous sound so staggered the accompanying orchestra, the players jerked their heads up in astonishment, and many of them lost their place. The Southern Court Union went back the following year, and won again, this time against a crack London choir. The music critic of the Times was just amazed. The singing of the Welsh choir was remarkable for its force and power. Comparing them with the Londoners who are usually heard, we should say that a Welsh voice was about equal to three London voices. When it is remembered that this chorus is almost entirely drawn from the labouring classes of the Principality, miners, colliers, their wives, daughters and relatives, we cannot but wonder at the excellence they have attained. An excellence unattainable except through assiduous and continued study. Just over 20 years before, Parliament commissioned a report into the state of education in Wales. Here it is, in two volumes. Which condemned us the Welsh for being primitive, ignorant, uncultured, that our women were moral, and that the Welsh language was a bar in the way of becoming a civilised people. Now the two triumphs at the Crystal Palace exposed that prejudiced pony for what it was. Because we had shown that we were able to learn, and to appreciate and to master the works of great European composers. English was the language most people in Wales spoke anyway, even in South Wales. The triumph of the core mouth vindicated us and showed the world that the Welsh working class was civilised and disciplined. And this was only the tip of the iceberg. At home, every chaplain had its choir. Wales was truly at claim, the land of song. Singing in a choir was a useful distraction from pressing social and industrial problems. In 1873, South Wales was recovering from a bitter industrial conflict that saw 160,000 miners on strike. The dispute ended. The image of the land of song was to be more permanent. And Carradog had brought a magnificent trophy from London to prove it. Glad uh, Carradog didn't drop that on his foot. Uh, Emma Tell us something about it. This was made in 1871 by an architect called S.J. Nickel, and it cost £1,000 to make at the time, and was used as the prize in the International Choral Competition in London, held at the Crystal Palace in 1872 and 1873. The trophy itself is in a number of sections. You can see there's a coronet at the top with uh, some rare stones around it. Also, at the bottom here, there's a wood screen on each corner, there being a composer to signify music through the ages. And really, this is a symbol of the musicality of Wales, musicianship of Wales during the 1870s, at a time when the South Wales Valleys were going through a period of industrial strife. This is a sense of optimism 
really, of the musicianship, of the singers, of the whole community. If the poor Maur had shown that they loved their music in Aberdeer, over the mountain in the next valley they were crazy about it. The baton was being passed on. If there was anywhere where the flames of passion for choral music reached a white heat of furnace intensity, it was here, Bertha Tidvin. And I want to find out if that's how the people of Bertha themselves saw it. I got here the Merthyr Express. I want to find some reference. Ta, ah, now then, we've got something here. The visit of the Estevod. And if there's any doubt that anybody might have had that it wasn't a hothouse of music, this surely would clear it up. Listen to this. If Wales is the land of song, Merthyr is the capital of that happy land. For it's the centre of a great district, thickly populated, with a large Welsh speaking section where music is the very breath of life to the majority of the people, and where the Estevod is the most popular form of social entertainment, its methods being imbibed from earliest childhood. Merthyr was a great music centre because it was Wales' first industrial town. In fact, and the crosses of Merthyr had built the biggest ironworks in the world. And here, on the terrace of his modest home in Cavartha Castle, Robert Crawshay's private band used to play, and their strings used to be heard over there in Chapel Row, where they inspired the young Joseph Parry. Joseph Parry, a product of Merthyr's rich musical culture, became the prolific and popular composer of tunes that stirred Welsh emotion and he wrote one love song that has become synonymous with a Welsh male choir. <laughs> South Wales was growing at a cost rate. The population of Wales as a whole increased by a million in the second half of the 19th century. Two thirds of them were in the southern industrial belt. As towns and villages sprang into existence, they needed to find an identity for themselves. And it was choirs that provided one of the platforms for this expression. Choral singing not only tapped into the emotional and psychological needs for dramatic expression, as did rugby and football and boxing, it even outdid them. Wales won its first rugby triple crown in 1893. There were 15,000 at the Cardiff Arms Park to see them beating England. A few months later, there were 20,000 listening to the chief choral event at the National Estevod in Pontypridd. there was another side to Welsh choralism. The best known musician in late 19th century murder was the fiery Dan Davis of Dowlais. And in Cavartha Castle Museum there are some of the medals and cups and batons that he won with his Merthyr and Dowlais choirs. This is the baton presented to Dan Davis when his Dowlais choir won at the Aberdeer National Eisteddfod in 1885. They were shouting odds of six to one on Llanelli around the Estevod field. There was a lot of gambling on the big choir competitions in those days. And the result provoked uproar at the back of the packed pavilion of 12,000. There were scuffles. People were throwing clods of earth at each other. They couldn't see properly. Perhaps they couldn't hear. But I suspect they were just disappointed punters. He was called Terrible Dan because of his volatile temperament. When he left the Dowlois Harmonic Choir, to conduct the Merthyr Philharmonic, barely three miles away, he was regarded in Dowlais as a traitor of the deepest dye. Once Dan Davis was stoned here in Merthyr High Street, 
and his choir would be jeered and catcalled. Not just his choir, that was par for the course. There was often mayhem, and sometimes police would be called to an Esteddwod in a local chapel vestry because choristers and their supporters were hissing and barracking to prevent a rival choir from being heard or even from getting up onto the platform. They would storm the stage to confront an apparently deaf adjudicator that had given them an unfavourable decision. Two eminent musicians were chased from a local estethod near Ammonford all the way to the train station by the irate reporters of a losing choir. Dan Davis wasn't a good loser either. When he lost in the Llandidno National Estethod in 1896, the chief adjudicator, a famous London musician, was the target of his abuse. I was accosted by the conductor of a choir that had been top of the pole at nearly all previous meetings, who, black with rage and disappointment, advised me if I valued my reputation never to set foot in Wales again. We can be pretty sure that was Dan the Man, one of Merthyr's fighting class. These choral competitions were described as choral bullfights and as musical prize fighting by the London papers, who sent their reporters down to cover them. There were over 60 pressmen at the Newport National Estethod in 1897, when, we are told, thousands crowded into the pavilion and excitement ran high. For next, after a football match, Welshmen enjoy a choral fight. And they got one. Dan Davis lost again. And when it was time for the eminent adjudicator, Sir Alexander Mackenzie, to leave the pavilion, he was advised to avoid the main exit, as there was a group of hostile-looking men waiting outside for him. So he was shown the rear door and escorted via side streets back to the safety of his hotel. Dan Davis was shown the door too, but if his star was waning at home, it was still very much in the ascendant 3,000 miles away, as he discovered in 1904. This is Washington, and this is the White House. And exactly 100 years ago, Dan Davis was greeted here by the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, who said he was delighted to meet the most famous conductor who had won more prizes as a conductor in his own country than any other. So Teddy Roosevelt, who gave his name to the teddy bear, embraced Cuddly Dan. And it could be that the notoriously energetic, rough-riding president who enjoyed ranching in the Badlands of Dakota saw a kindred spirit in Dan Davis from the Badlands of Dolais. They knew all about the land of song in America. That's the point about Welsh choral singing. It wasn't some parochial village pastime. These choirs would tour the world. They would visit overseas. They would come here to the most competitive country in the world to compete and to win. And I'll tell you about that next week.